Now we have a strange topic here, but it's something that's just as true. And this topic is one of truth. Okay, I just woke up and I almost ran out of sugar. I still have a bit of uh, icing sugar left. And now I'm in this strange, strange position where, you know, I cannot just go to the shop and buy loads of sugar. And then you could say, well, that's very bad for the industry because if we don't sell sugar, right, we don't make enough money. So, you know, if you see if everybody would live a life like I do, <laughs> right? But you will never get everyone to live a life like I do because now apart from the fact why I am where I am and my own personal circumstances, there will always be children, you know, even, you know, let's say there's a child born into a family and the parents are like the super yogis and they know all about Tantra and they know all about how to eat and what to eat and when to eat and whether or not to hold hands in public and they know about energy flow and you know they stand in connection with nature. There's no guarantee that their child will do the same thing. Because their child needs to make their own experiences in life. And when the child would choose to simply go back into society and to be an accountant and to just work in such a way, then that is just the way it is. So parents can only teach a child to a certain degree and then they have to let go and just let the child do what the child wants to do and you will never stop being a parent and you know that goes for the crack whore that may have forgotten that she ever gave birth to a child and dropped it off at an orphanage or something and that goes for the 75 year old woman that started telling herself that she hates her children because she's unable to open up to them 
Because maybe she is like this kind of, you know, kind of a hipster spiritual woman, but her children are different. It's just very hard to maintain a loving relationship. So, you know, I'm in this strange position, you know, should I take this jar, go to my neighbors and ask her for sugar? Or should I just not have any? Because that would be the more honest approach. Because who am I to come to you and ask for your energy? I mean, if you would come to me and say, hey, Christopher, do you need sugar? And then you would give it to me. Then I would know you have something to give. But if you don't do that, then I have to assume that you've just got nothing to give. And there are simply people who have a lot to give. And then the question is, should I have a woman by my side who also has a lot to give? Or should I have one by my side who has nothing to give? Sure, I mean, if I imagine myself with a woman that's like super flexible, knows how to do yoga, wants to practice Tantra and all of these kinds of things, you know, it sounds very beautiful. But maybe that's just wishful thinking. So I work with what is, but I allow myself also to see what I think I deserve. And the women I've been with usually treated me like crap, all of them. And I've really tried, believe me, I mean, I've brought a woman that was pregnant with a child and she didn't know who the father was because she was on drugs at a party. And I've helped her through pregnancy and two months I stayed with her and that child and helped her because the birth was hard and I just stayed there and took care of her. And then two months after the birth, I left because she was still squeezing me for more, but I just had nothing to give. She was just squeezing me for more juice, but I just had nothing to give to her anymore. And that was at the point where after all those weeks that I spent with her emotional outbreaks and her instability, I'm just going to say, you know, I had my own instabilities, but I kept it kind of to myself. I mean, I just did what I felt like I had to do. I don't want to appear like overly saintly because if you'd ask her, maybe her perspective would be different, but I still did what I did. I went out of my way to help her. And it was when I had this feeling, you know, I wanted to fast for six or seven days. And I was really, I felt weak three days into it, like really weak. And I received no support from her. You know, I remember how I was sitting on the couch and I felt weak. And she was standing there with her child. Two months after, you know, I helped her get through childbirth. You know, I was the one that drove her son home because she was taken by an ambulance. You know, I'm just saying I did all of that. And then I was sitting on her couch on my third or second day of the fast. And I felt, because I've never done a fast like that, you know, I felt overwhelmed and weak. And she looked at me and said, maybe you should rather invest your energy into us than to 
sit on the couch and fast. So she was telling me to throw overboard my own spiritual needs for whatever reason. So, you know, in the end, she felt happy to be strong and see me weak and she dumped on me immediately. And three days later, I left. And three days after that, I came back and told her that I broke up and it came to her as a shock. And she just gave me more crap. And that was that. And then once she wrote me an email and said, you know, do you want to come back? And I said, no, you know, why would I come back? I mean, you know, I liked it. You know, the idea, but I also was in that position where I could just leave. Because why would I ever go back to that? I mean, because it would be exactly the same, you know? I would go back and it would be exactly the same. But it wasn't my mistake. She was the one who got loaded on drugs and just slept with a random stranger and then got pregnant. And I did what I can. I did what I could at the time that I did it. And after that, it was all I could do to just hold myself together and to not just hate her, but to simply say, that's a boundary for me. And she will never overstep this boundary again. Because yeah, you looked all pretty and nice, but when I, you know, s you know when I dusted off your mantelpiece, I just found more dust. And I actually found that, you know, underneath the dust, there was just shit. So rather leave the dust on there. So yeah, the question is, you know, I can go to my neighbor and I can ask her for sugar. And then she will probably smile and be like, <laughs> super nice. I've seen that before. And when the door closes, she thinks, what an asshole. He can't even afford his own sugar. So sometimes it's better to just show strength and to simply have no sugar when you have no sugar than to run to others to ask for them for sugar. Because already people think you're weak when you leave the house and you wear no shoes in winter. They think you're the one that needs help. But from your perspective, I clearly think you need help. Because if you feel cold, because you see me without shoes, then it is you who has forgotten who he is. Because that is then projection. You, know, you see me and you assume that you know how I feel. Oh, the poor guy, he has no shoes. Let's give him shoes. I don't want your damn shoes. Focus on yourself. I am here by my own free choice. I chose to leave the house without shoes and record myself and you thought I was some kind of random homeless person. You could just, oh wow, finally someone, you know. I can help to make myself feel better and then I can go home and I can say, oh yeah, there was this guy, he had no shoes and I gave him some and you know, oh yeah, I really helped someone today. But you didn't. You didn't. But you could have helped yourself. By learning something from him. Because apparently he knows how to be in bare feet in the cold. Which is why when I see a homeless person who spends all the year round out on the streets, you know, I see strength. And most people see weakness. But most homeless people that I meet, I mean, or a lot of them, you know, they are also on the streets because they choose to be on the streets. Because if I really wanted to, you know, I could. Right? If I really wanted to be an accountant or work for the government as a, 
whatever environmental protection uh, advisor. You know, I could do that. But it would be phony. It would be dishonest. Because I have no wish to do that. Because I know what the government is up to. I mean, it's just a play of power. And I don't want to feed into that. You know, it doesn't mean I have to destroy them. You know, I'm just saying I don't have to be radical about it. And then say, because I don't work for the government, you know, I have to hate them. But in a sense, you know, I'm working for the government because I'm speaking to the people who are a bit like me. Right. And I'm teaching them how to use their anger to do something good for society because, I mean, society is the reason that you are watching this at the moment. And that you have all your little comforts and all your sugar and all your radiators and the oil or the gas or the electricity that, you know, makes your apartment warm in winter. And then you can say, yeah, but I hate that. Yeah, but the truth is there's always a part in you that actually really enjoys spending a nice Sunday afternoon watching a movie, eating some cake. Well, the cake is a product of this society. And all the clothes that you wear are a product of this society. So you can sit around hating all of that, or you can just say, you know what, you know, I'm just gonna ask my neighbors if she has some sugar for me because I have none. Or you just say, you know, maybe I just learn how to do what I'm doing without the sugar. Because what I learned recently is that could, look, this could have been a stutter, <laughs> but I dragged it out. Because what's a stutter but words that like are stuck at coming out. So now I'm coming to the good part, which is there is a way to, you know, during sex, or let's say, during orgasm, a man has the ability to, instead of, okay, I come from a history of watching porn. And I remember a lot of these actresses by name, because <laughs> that's what I grew into and I can imagine that in 50 years time I may still remember them or may I may have forgot about them and there is this I mean for anyone who knows that this is not trying to get you to watch this but they were called yeah I'm gonna keep that to myself But it is a couple and she's like Pakistani or something and he's, I don't know, because it's a weird thing. Sometimes you never see her, his face. And he just, you know, I don't know, sometimes you see these men and they just, you know, ejaculate and ejaculate and ejaculate so many times. And there's so much stuff coming out and you're wondering, wait, is he taking like pills? Or is this what a real woman can do to a man? And she just like, over and over, just like, and it looks, I mean, you see this woman lying there. She's not your woman. And she will probably never have children. But you know, you don't know that, of course. But what's the point of having sex? Okay, the way it used to be is men knew, yes, some men, it's not always all men, you know, it's not like society used to be different and everybody knew how to do yoga, no, because there's always people that just keep society going, however society may look like, even in a tribe, there's always people that know something that others don't, you know. There's like what you may call a yogi in an indigenous tribe, 
they may practice different forms of yoga but yoga is comes already you know i mean you were born right so there's like black and white and if there's an imbalance you know then you use yogic techniques to get your balance back and then it's your responsibility these days to see if there is an imbalance because everybody has an imbalance you just have to find your own and then if you've got you know as a man too much masculine right the anger i want to punch through a wall you know you have to do a bit of gentle soothing with your feminine side you know and take care of yourself and maybe instead of drinking a coffee with sugar because you lack energy you just sleep and be a bit lazy and that's then what happens and sure you know if i see that image of that guy and he just you know comes into this beautiful woman but i've seen their journey because i started watching you know i watched it and i really paid attention which later on inspired me to write the book called sexual depression which is in its essence also you know it's just about sexuality everything i knew at the time i wrote it everything i had learned from porn you know why we do it and what how you could get out of there you know i just put it all into a book and that means there's a lot of stuff in there because i what you know after i had awakened i continued to watch porn but i really paid attention you know i looked at it i wanted to understand it and so i used it and 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 then i used it less and less and less until i could no longer be tracked by giving my energy to this kind of junk but while i felt like i was still stuck i just used it to understand it to understand myself to understand why we have this if it's actually honest because in 99% of the cases of the material you find out there it's actually more like rape i mean there are very few instances and of course you have to understand what it does to your energy body to expose yourself in such a way i mean a woman that wants to give a child i mean angry men are using her to waste their potential because they have no direction in life your direction should be to have your own family but you if you live in the shame of you know having watched porn and masturbated it's very hard to find a woman that actually wants to be together with you that's what i found and so okay what i'm trying to say is whatever there is a way to learn how to you know mantak chia calls this sexual kung fu so and there are other people who have talked about it you know i'm not why is this always so stuck here you know either i am Yeah, there's certainly a part of me that starts to get annoyed by recording myself. So I'm also glad if this can stop. I started to realize it. There's a part of me that really needs a break from putting the camera onto myself. Which is why this idea where it came from is just a stroke of genius to simply record all of this and then to just let go of it and put that camera aside for a while or use it for something else you know i don't really know or maybe you know i really need this and it's really important that i do it 
but it's certainly burdensome. So there may be people who just felt like they wanted to do porn and they do it to help others. Because if a woman does porn, I mean, I mean, she, these women kind of did help me, I think, to get through life because I had something beautiful to look at. And, you know, whatever somebody does is always, there's always choice involved. And that's just how it is. Life spares no one. If you find yourself in such a corner where you do porn or you watch it, that's just how it is. But you can always change that. I mean, there are porn actresses who stopped with porn and then they talk about it and then they say, I think it's terrible. And then they sit there and they have a body and have enlarged breasts, enlarged breasts, but they just accept it and then just say, you know, you can do this in a different way. And they, that's just then how it is. But if you're really stuck in darkness, you know, that may help you for a while. But I wanted to learn how to preserve my energy, how to keep it inside and how to feed other things that I find actually worthwhile, that are healthy for a family. Because let's say you meet a woman and you have a child together and you are still stuck on watching porn. It's going to be very hard to give your family what they need. And that was clearly also the point you know, this woman had a point, absolutely, to a certain degree. Only while I was there, I did not watch porn. And if she would have been a little bit nicer to me, I would have stayed. But she just never gave me any space. She just never gave me any room. She just tried to change me into someone that I was not. You know, people asked her, you know, what do you think that he walks around barefoot everywhere? And she was unsure what to say to that because she paid too much attention to what people thought. Well, too bad, right? In any case, I left and I learned that Mantak Chia is teaching people, you know, how to during an orgasm instead of shooting your ejaculation, you know, in sh shooting the energy out of your body with, by ejaculating, you know, you channel it, you pull it into you, into your body. And that requires a lot of strength of will. And I would say probably of the entire human race, that's 1%. It's just speculation. But from everyone I know, nobody knows this. They just release, but I wanted to hold it. Now, recently, you know, when I first learned it, I was like, what, that's possible? Nice. And recently I've told someone that this is possible and he felt like, Ugh, why should I do that? So he was even disgusted with his own energy. While for me, if I pull it within whatever I'm trying to release there, you know, that's then my nutrition to go on with my work. And that's not dirty at all because my body is a channeler of energy. And if I always dump all this food in there, you know, sure, when I wake up, I'll probably want to drink a coffee with sugar. But maybe I can also drink a coffee without the sugar. Well, that's a far stretch from where I'm coming from. And what I could do is, you know, I could roast. It says, you know, just go and get the damn sugar. But why? You know what the industry does, the sugar industry? How much slaughter and hatred just because we here are greedy for sugar because we want. I mean, do you think we could do any of the stuff that we do here? without coffee and sugar and all the stuff we steal from other countries? Do you think we could do any of that? 
I hardly doubt it. Because you have to be like mentally unstable. And that's also, you know, you have to forget the shit. But the shit is always there. So if I drink a coffee to forget the shit, I forget how to hum humble myself. And I will dump on my elders instead of, you know, appreciating and worshipping them. You know, not worshipping in the sense of, you know, it's like, oh. But in Tanzania, there is a word, it's called shikamo. And that's what you say to someone who's older than you. And it's a sign of respect. Shikamo means I kiss your feet. And that's Kiswahili. That's the language of Tanzania. And you say Shikamo, as I remember it correctly. And it means I kiss your feet, right? Without having to go down and actually kiss your feet, I just Shikamo. And then the, the elder person, so, you know, a, sh a child would have to say Shikamo to me if the child would respect me. But who am I to the child in the Tanzanian village, right? But I think at this stage, I can say, you know, I have self-respect. And that's why they could acknowledge me, because I can hold myself straight. Also in social situations. If you would be like this, like most people that I see here walk around in your shoes, like not even able to walk straight. So you forgot to take care of yourself. Yeah, they would probably say, you know, they say jambo. If it's the same, you know, it's like also, it's not just age, it's, you know, like, it's like the, you know, I see you, what they do in the Avatar movie with the blue people. It's just a form of respect, right? And we, so you say jambo, it's, you know, for people of the same age. And then it's shikamo, I kiss your feet, kind of. And, well, I find that very hard because how am I supposed to respect my elders if my elders have no respect for me? And that's my standpoint, because to me, a lot of people that I see in terms of conscious development, they just seem like children because ignorance is a child, right? You know, ignorance is a child, and that's then from the movie Bruce Almighty, where <laughs> Jim Carrey is like, you know, God is a child sitting on an ant heap, ant heap with a magnifying glass, or something like this, you know, and I'm the ant. <laughs> and then God comes and says, you know, here, I give you my responsibilities, and then what you know, Bruce Almighty or, you know, yeah, the character has to realize in that movie is that, you know, being God doesn't just come with, you know, having a good time. It comes with a lot of responsibility, hearing voices in your mind of prayers and then redirecting the energy to whoever needs help the most, but also who has earned the right to receive help. And so when you start on your spiritual journey, there may come a time where you do start hearing voices, but so do many other people. It's just the question, what kind of voices do you listen to? Because if I go now, you know, I've been paid with food I've been paid with food, but the problem is if I cook it, I have to eat it and then I have to defecate and then I've gone out of my way to help someone else getting rid of the food while, right? I don't know, I just feel like eating is a waste of time and it blocks my energy. <laughs> But at the same time, it's also a way to cope food. And so is masturbation. Masturbation is also a way to cope. 
to just say, you know, I've given enough, I've given enough, I've given enough. You know, I do art, I've given enough. I try to give to myself. Because what masturbation and then orgasming is, is also a way to transcend. You know, you feel bad now. And then suddenly it's like, whoosh. But I'd rather have that energy available than to just feel, whoosh. okay? You know, I can, I can masturbate myself through fear. And suddenly I feel good again, but then the fear comes back. And so the way to go is not to ejaculate it into a tissue, but to... And for that you have to learn how to contract your pelvic floor muscles. But it's more the will to feel where the energy is going and then before it wants to slip out, because that's a part of your soul. And before it slips out, you know, you just redirect it and at some stage, and it's much easier when you're fasting. What I've learned is that if I'm on a fast, when I'm fasting, I stop the urge to constantly masturbate and ejaculate just stops. And that was a great experience, but it's also strange because if you've never experienced that, because normally nobody fasts, you always eat and everybody makes sure that you eat. But at some stage, maybe it would be a good experience to just know how you would feel like if you wouldn't eat for seven days or six days. Just sure you have, make sure you have an irrigator at home to flush your colon once a day with lukewarm water. You can even make chamomile tea and then just make sure it's lukewarm, right? You don't want to burn yourself. So between maybe 30 and 36 degrees Celsius. And then you can cleanse and heal your colon. How many doctors have told you to do that? You know, I'm just saying. Doctors have no knowledge of anything. You know, they just want to make a living and feel like there's some kind of almighty God. And that comes at the cost of the health of other people, because if people that actually are psychotic cut you open without knowing anything about spirit and energy flow, they will just cut through lines of energy in their body, in your body and destroy them. And then you have to work extra hard to heal that. Because they actually make more damage. And that's just a fact. Just by thinking about it, anyone would know that. But if I would only talk about this in here, they would probably ban me. And that's just a fact. Because then they would say, oh, wow, you know, he's like, what is he saying? Yeah, doctors are insane. Because only somebody who forgot who he is can operate in such a way, you know, to find pleasure in dissecting others. That's insanity. But that's the general norm, right? You have problems with your hip, you replace it. You know, you don't work on it. You don't figure out what's causing your hip to be in such a way. You don't question your diet. No, no, no. You just run to the doctor and give your hand, give yourself into the hands of a man, which all these women do. You know, I know many old women who go to doctors just because they want to be touched by a man. And then that man makes money with that. And then he cuts them open and then he sends them home and then they're like, damn it, you know. Instead, they could have gone hiking, strengthened themselves, learned how to cook, sorted out their own emotional stuff, be either okay on their own or open up to a new relationship with somebody who, you know, law of attraction resembles them a little. So there are many different ways of living your life. And I just decided, you know, I'll rather learn from 
who came before me. But I'll never have it all together. I'll probably keep some of my quirks just to remember where I come from. And maybe then the children that come after, come after me, they will, you know, hate recording themselves just because I did it. Yeah, my father, right? <laughs> they would say something like this. My father was always with his camera and, you know, he could have spent more time with me. Oh yeah, poor little child. Got, didn't give, get all the attention that it wanted. Yeah. And the same happened to me then. And so I want to learn from the mistakes that I can see, you know, if a father is too focused on earning money and getting rich. But you can never give everything to a child. And some children don't even want it. I always had my own way. And I always felt like I knew where I wanted to be. And I also tried to get away from my father most of the time. Because I felt like he wanted to control me and tell me how to live my life and what to do. But I just couldn't allow that to happen. And in that sense, it's like that story Zidata, where he leaves his family home to just travel and be like a traveling monk. Only that I still had connection to my parents because of phones and stuff. But, you know, in ancient times, I would have just left. And that's a fact, I would have just left. But then it also would have been different because then people like me would have been normal and they would have actually gotten support from society because it would have been acknowledged that people who learn how to meditate and to fast and do all these kinds of things are actually beneficial to a society. And it's like calming the hive, right? Everybody's running around like, you know, it's like I just drank five coffee and ate all this sugar. And you know, then I ate meat from insane cows. And I no longer even know what I am in all of this madness. And then I walk around. Of course, on the outside, I just look like this. <laughs> but on the inside, I'm like, yeah. yeah. And that's then how it is. And of course, from such a perspective, you know, they think probably I'm mad or they just hate me. <laughs> because I look like, I mean, I have it together. I mean, I've been in intense situations and I never lost my shit. I just, you know, when I get loud, I do so because you are losing yours. And I just have to remind you that you've got work to do. And you can ask you why, well, because if I see it, I have to name it. And if I see a man, you know, ejaculating into a woman over and over again, it's like, <sighs> Uh, uh, I see weakness, but everyone else wants to even see it, right? You know, they want to see how the man ejaculates into it because then they can see themselves in it. You know, nobody wants to see a guy who just has sex for six hours. They just get bored. It's like, yeah, whatever. I mean, he's got strength, you know, good for him. You know, but that's what I'm working to, just to learn to not ejaculate. And I've managed. It just works. And if I now would imagine, you know, I didn't eat and there would be a woman, energy would flow naturally. I could keep going, you know, but that's at this stage. Because I haven't tested it. It's also an assumption. But that's when you can truly find healing. And that's when I don't have to go and have ayahuasca or drink ayahuasca or take LSD, you know. I can just transcend myself and the woman that I'm with. And then we find incredible 
bliss and peace just with the two of us. And all we need is maybe a bit of water or tea or some fruit. Or maybe you don't eat at all. And it's also probably better to do it on an empty stomach. So that, you know, you don't feel like having to defecate or pee all the time. But of course, to most, it's just a strange concept. But I guarantee you, people want to even see weakness because they themselves are weak. And if they'd see strength, you know, they would just start to hate that because it would show them how weak they are themselves. And because, you know, they're living life in this kind of, you know, I'm super strong. They can never, right? We're doing good. We're science, you know, we're like, yeah. And then of course, all the sugar and the coffee. And then some people take, you know, that's just amphetamines. That's heroin. That's all that stuff that we put into ourselves that gives us the feeling that we're powerful. I mean, if you smoke tobacco, you feel like, yeah. But let me take that away from you. And then just observe you for one week, you know. I'd see your weakness then. As long as you have your smoke, you're like super strong. As long as you have your sugar, you're like super strong. As long as you have your coffee, you're like super strong. But if I take that away from you, suddenly it's like, I need sugar. I need it. Yeah, and then you walk around and you start shouting at people. Yeah, that are symptoms of withdrawal, my friend. It's like Aang, Aang, Aang in the Last Airbender Avatar series where he loses or where Appa is being taken away. Now, partly one source of Aang's happiness is probably also A Appa, right? So a lot of his strength also comes from his companions. And then, you know, it's just a story, of course, but it's true. You know, suddenly Appa is being taken away. And from this gentle kid that just like, oh, let's just have fun. Yes, suddenly Appa is gone. And then the monks would say, no attachments, no attachments. But yeah, he just goes out of his way, gets Appa back. Because of course, in a way, they also needed Appa to win the war. So what I have to acknowledge is I also need things to keep going. Otherwise, I will just vanish. Or so I may think, unless I know how to center myself in myself rather than out of myself. Because if I'm only trying to center myself with the ridiculous habits that I have, such as drinking coffee and all of these things, you know, I forget how to just do that on my own. And that's, of course, where meditation is for. And no wonder nobody can meditate. Because if you smoke tobacco, you know, drink alcohol, eat all this sugar and drink coffee and have to inhale the toxic fumes of cars and are being bombarded with all this noise. And you leave the house and all you see is these angry wraiths, which is everyone I meet on the streets. And you just see sickness and weakness. I mean, how are you supposed to then? I mean, who are you supposed to have as, a, as an idol? You know, somebody who's strong, which is why each and every one of us who learns how to take care of themselves, who learns how to be strong in a gentle way, in just a, I stand here, 
and I'm a perfect representation of who I found in myself, which is a being of light that acknowledges that there's shadow. And the shadow I can use also as strength, and that brings us back to yoga. It's not just being light and like, oh, ha, 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 ha. you know, it's being in the state where there's shadow and light. And instead of just feeding my shadow and pretending I'm light, because that's what society does, we just feed our shadows and we pretend that we're nice. But on the inside, you know, all we do is gossip. All we do is gossip. And that's what I've been raised into. Parents that just gossip about everyone. And we just assume everyone does it. And I assume, you know, everyone did. You know, family meets. You know, let's say for Christmas. And everybody's like, oh, oh it's so nice. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like one hour, two hour of conversation. And then, you know, the other family members leave. Like aunts and uncles and... And then everybody's like, bah, what was that? Uh, maybe next year we should just do it on our own. Yeah, and so we did. There is no... And I'm not sure, you know, is this the way other cultures do it as well? Or is it just Germans? Because I have to say that Okay, maybe it's just the way it is, right? Maybe my parents were just different from everyone else. I mean, I choose to kind of distance myself. Because if you are an awakened one, it stands to reason that your parents were at least, you know, probably a bit different than everyone else. That's just my own story. Also, my parents were kind of different. And when they met, right, okay. So all these social games that people are playing, there are people that just don't play it. And so your parents might be Brahmin, Brahman, whatever. They just don't tell you. <laughs> but... It's always the same, right? You think you're enlightened, but who's going to come after you? So was Alan Watts enlightened? Who cares? I mean, he had children, he had family, but it was said that he had sex with whatever his patients were. But if you have children and a family, I think... You know, I'm not sure about it. Should you be denied to have sex with whoever you want to have sex with? Just because people say that that's the way it has to be. Because if a woman cannot catch you and hold you as a man, then sure, you know, I'd get bored myself and I would look somewhere else for what I thought I was looking for. Yeah, so in certain ways I'm still lost at sea, while in other ways I feel like I found home. And I'm just trying to work with the things that I'm being presented with on a daily basis. So if I run out of sugar, do I run around and ask for it, or do I just accept it? Because it's also a conscious choice that I have no sugar. I could have left yesterday and tried to get it from the shops, but I didn't. That was a conscious choice. But it takes me an incredible amount of willpower. But everything I've done so far also has helped me. Recording myself during this phase also helps me. Um... And of course, also learning to find strength from other sources, such as what I'm doing. 
gives me strength. To know that I'm doing something at least to help people who may feel a bit like me. But only that would be just too phony because I'm not just doing it because I'm so nice. You know, I'm also doing it because, yeah, I just want to survive. And I also feel like at one stage I'd like to have a car, right? But at the moment, it's just so far away. So sometimes you have to sacrifice things for some time. You know, I've been sacrificing sex. I've been sacrificing most social events. I've been sacrificing internet. You know, my time I have on the internet, I've been sacrificing the time I spent with porn. You know, and some of these things I'll get back. Possibly, but never in the same way that I had them. And this is what I did, you know, I just let them go. And part of it, why I let it go was also so that I can learn to deal with all of this, which is a lot. A lot more than I think other people have to deal with. And I just had to take responsibility for who I am and my own abilities. But sure, if I don't drink coffee, you know, maybe that's just also a way of being humble. And maybe after I hit the, the record button that, you know, you hit it once, it records, you hit it again, it stops recording. You know, maybe I'll go and ask my neighbor for sugar. You know, just to have a reason to talk to someone and to just say, hey, I'm still there, you know. But at the same time, I often have misgivings about these things, you know. Because I have the feeling we'll never really be friends. But I also sometimes like to just startle people a little, but at the same time, maybe it's just good to leave everyone alone. Just show that you can do it yourself. Because if I go to you, you know, I'm like a beggar. And for me, it's just a game, but she may really struggle in there. And I really had to be left alone sometimes. And if you have to go back to work on Monday, then maybe you really want to just spend your Sunday alone without having to run errands for others. Because if I knock on the door and I ask you for sugar, then you have to maybe get off the couch and then give it to me. And so I'm invading your space because of my needs. And if that's not selfish, because I don't really need the sugar, I can just struggle through it. So if I'm going to ask you for a cigarette, because I want to smoke, then I am kind of wasting your time because I fail to see how I can just deal with my own addiction and just stop clinging. So when I watch that episode, where they're in the desert and Aang is frustrated because he lost his bison. Yeah, I mean, Katara just keeps them all together. I, I don't know, I never liked her. It's just hard to say why. Because she just seems like she's just trying to be so much better. But she's not really. And I'm just trying to see, you know, I don't know, for me, it probably wouldn't be tough. But I don't think I would ever like being with Katara. Because the only reason Katara wanted to be with Aang was because he was a powerful bender. Yeah. You probably would have dumped her. I would have dumped her. 
you know, I have a knack for disliking women that just want a man to feel powerful. You know, I have a knack for women that are in need of help. I don't know. That's just the maiden in distress, right? The damsel in distress. So yeah, rather than asking my neighbors for sugar, you know, I'll just wait till I get to the real sweet stuff. Which is then, you know, what a woman would give to me without having to ask for it. And that's what I never had. I've never been with a woman who wanted to just also please me. Because she was happy to have me. You know, every woman always acted like I was a burden to her. Right. And I just got sick of women that would just stab me in the back. Right. And that just came at the cost of being alone. But I was willing to pay that price and to distance myself from everyone so that, and also to stop reaching out to them so I could see who they truly were and what their true intentions were. And whatever has been going on in my mind, the message that I get from the outside is that who I thought would be my partner for life or my wife wasn't it at all. And still, while I'm saying this, you know, there's like, oh, maybe she's still it, you know, maybe she's just working to get back to you. And I just say, yeah, right. As if anyone would ever do that. As nice as it sounds, I'll just rather accept that I'm just going to do this on my own. To a certain degree, of course. Because everyone always gets help. Which is why I could never just hate Hitler, because in part, you know, it was Hitler that was responsible for my birth. Because the war led my grandparents to come here because they were living in an area that is now Poland. And when the Polish took over, or took back, you know, I'm not quite sure about that one. They had to flee. They didn't have to, but they wanted to flee because otherwise they would have had to change their names. And they said, we don't want that. So they did flee and they came here. And then my grandparents met and then my parents met here. I mean, just one part of my grandparents from my mother's side. And then they met and voila. Here we are. And here I am. So I'm alive because Hitler did what he did. And that sparked a whole lot of other things. And of course, it wasn't just Hitler. It's just who we dump it all on. You know, there were lots of people. And my point is also the whole world watched it and sat by until they said, now it's enough. You know, it's like seeing children and then you realize they're having a fight and you just wait, right? Until somebody gets hurt enough so that they learn the lesson. And then you say, now it's enough. You could have intervened before, but the truth is probably we learned the best of experiences. And I think, I mean, you would think Germany has learned their lesson, but discrimination is still a problem. You know, discrimination is still a problem. I mean, I've been discriminated against. 
just because other people were afraid of getting sick or something. And I just said, you know, I don't want to have your treatment because I know how to treat myself. And I had to take a lot of crap for that. And of course I was right to refuse it, this treatment. So everyone who accepted it was weak. And then you can use words like solidarity to justify what you're doing, but solidarity is an empty word and you can fill it with whatever you want it. Because if solidarity, you know, works for their cause, then it also works for mine because there was no solidarity for me from the people that wanted me to be an expression of their ideas of solidarity. Which is why, yeah, I wrote a book with a friend called the dignity of the unvaccinated. And that's what it's dealing with. Cheerio. Right? And that's all there is to it. Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean you cannot talk about it. And you cannot be open about it. Because unless you are, it will have you know, it will hold you for the rest of your life. And that's just a waste of time. And that's just what I think. So I'm working on the hold that sugar has on me. And it's a challenge to say the least. And that's it. Shoo.